if you plug into this amp, you're going to sound like you. Whether it's you, your guitar, your pedal board, um, it's going to translate really well what it is. You plug into this amp, you're going to sound like you. But it gets a very wide variety of tones, um, from the most saturated to the most pristine clear. The whole idea was to have an amp that covered the entire sonic range from vintage to very modern. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this really special live broadcast from True Fire. Uh, as most of you probably know, we are partnering with PRS this month on the month-long road trip promotion, uh, which we'll show you on the screen in just a sec. And uh, today, um, Brian Ewald, who has been on our radar screen for a long time, you know, there's a lot of six degrees of separation in the music business. And um, I, I, I've kept hearing his name over the years, and I finally get to meet him. He's an extraordinary uh, player, extremely knowledgeable about gear, does uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, session work, um, sideman work, uh, gear presentations, um, and I've heard so much about him, and I am thrilled to introduce him to you today, who's going to tell us about the PRS gear we're featuring uh, with uh, PRS. Brian, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, man, pleasure. Love your digs there. Oh, oh thank you. Gigs. That's not a Zoom background, right? Like that's the real <laughs> deal. Yeah, this is my basement. This is uh, it's and uh, yeah. If if uh, you could actually spin the camera around at this point, um, the guitars just keep keep going all the way around. You know, <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that, right? Especially when you're kind of a little bit stuck at home, right? It's a good place to be stuck. I know, but fortunately, you're doing, um, you get to do kind of, uh, you do so many different things, man. You do session work, you do, you're on the road, um, you do presentations. So you're, you've been working on tracking a lot of new music with many of your artist buddies, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's the nice thing about having a home studio is that you can uh, uh, continue to work remotely. I wouldn't be doing this if this were 15, 20 years ago, and I still had my, my 16 track reel to reel down here. <laughs> For sure, man. Can't really email that back and forth. But so um, you are going to do, and we so generous of you to do this. And we're really looking forward to not just this one, but three of these throughout the month. Um, each one focused on a particular piece of the PRS prize pool. But do us a favor, as this is the first one, just tell us what the whole prize pool is and then tell us what you want to drill deep down on today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for those who may not know, I, um, I, I, I get to do a lot of stuff with PRS. They bring me in to do the product demo videos and I do clinics and NAM and stuff. So I, get a, uh, I have the, the honor of being able to play tons of their gear and get to know it really well inside and out. Uh, the, the amp that we're going to talk about today is not uh, is no exception. They um, pulled together a an acoustic, which is a T60E, which we'll be looking at uh, in a in couple weeks. Um, that's a fantastic uh, guitar. Uh, there is a guitar that I have right here with me. This is the brand new McCarty 594S2 uh, single cut. The, this, this has just been announced recently. They're just starting to hit the streets. So if you win this, you'll probably be the first one on your block to, to get one. Um, we'll, I'll actually play this a little bit today. You'll be hearing this, uh, but we'll go in depth on this one, uh, I believe on the 22nd of May. Um, and last but not least is this uh, small beast of an amp behind me is the Sanzera, 20 watt Sanzera combo. 
Um, and that's the one we're really going to kind of dig in. We'll go through all its features. We'll talk about it. We'll listen to it and um, obviously take any questions anybody may have about it. Awesome. So we do have um, we do have live chat and please load up uh, that chat feed with as many questions as you have about the ant today. We really, really want to drill down deep. And Brian, I know that, um, you know, there's always audio issues, you know, with these live presentations. So yeah. you were kind enough and I encourage you to, you know, you recorded um, some pre-recorded demos. Anytime you want to roll those, just shout out to Tommy uh, so folks can get a better kind of sonic uh, experience. For sure. Anytime. I'll 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 be doing some live playing and twisting knobs and talking about it. Um, but like well, all I did was I took a couple um, backing tracks, just bass and drum backing tracks that I recorded down here, and and did a, a clean rhythm and lead. And then I went through on the exact same backing track, uh, and that was done with single coils. And then I went on the exact same backing track and I did a rhythm and lead uh, with humbuckers on the lead channel, just so people can get an idea. Um, there's going to be probably less audio quirkiness and distortion if it's being played that way. And obviously there's some great demos on the PRS YouTube channel. Uh, you can go hear the amp, uh, but mainly we'll kind of, we'll, we'll get into it and kind of talk about what the amp is and some, you know, the general idea of the PRS amp line. And um, uh, there's not as not, not nearly as many amps in the amp line as there are guitars. So it's pretty easy to surmise his, his, uh, his amp world. Um, so you want to just kick right into it? Yep. The stage is yours. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, before we get into the specs on this one, um, I'll give you kind of an overview of what there is in the in the amp world of PRS. For a long time, the amps were built in the, uh, in the same tiny little room, only a handful of people. It hasn't gotten much bigger there. The amp par part of the factory is still very small. Doug Sewell, uh, who used to have his own amp line called Sewell Amps, who was uh, from Dallas, Texas, is an incredible designer and builder. He he is Paul's partner in the amp world. The two of them really are the uh, the backbone behind uh, all of the designs, or at least the you know the the final decisions on all the designs. Um, there uh, for a long time, I had there's an amp directly to the left of here called the two channel custom, which was one of the more common PRS amps. That two channel amp, uh, pretty full featured, you know, reverb and uh, your your typical kind of great working man's grab and go amp, you know, you can take it and get everything you need. Built in the US and it, it you know, wasn't cheap. A lot of the PRS stuff is pricey stuff. It's hand built. Um, but Paul uh, wanted to put a line of amps into the market that were a little bit more accessible and affordable to more players. And he did that a long time ago with the SE guitars, having having guitars built overseas and then brought back into Maryland to be set up and gone over before they go out. Um, and he said something to me that I found pretty interesting was that it was actually a lot easier for him to design and build these than it was the guitars. So building an instrument that he's willing to put his name on and, and partnering with somebody to build that, um, you're talking about craftsmanship and working with wood and all kinds of uh, less, uh, more variables, you know, le less predictable things. Um, building a circuit, an electronic circuit, if the design is good, if you stay on top of quality control in both the sourcing of the parts and the production, uh, these amps still all come back to Maryland. But he said building a, an electronic device, think about like the phones that most of us have in our pocket or that I'm actually using as a camera here to stream, uh, you know, was built overseas and it just works. Um, you know, it's, it's mainly about design and, and quality control. So building this amp, this amp comes in well at under a thousand bucks. It is one of two different amps in the Sanzera line. Almost all of his amps have a lower wattage and a higher wattage. This is the 20 watt. There is a 50 watt version. Um, the, they have the same preamp. It is a, a larger box, but it's still a single 12. Um, I've gigged, I gigged with a 50 watt when it first came out quite a bit. And I've had this 20 watt for maybe a year now. Um, and they are slightly different in their sonic character, just the different power sections. 
Uh, but I think this is one of my favorite amps PRS has made, regardless of price point. Um, so going through the specs real quick, it is two independent channels. We have a clean channel here, very simple three knob design, bass, treble, and volume, single volume. Uh, it is set up as a, um, a, a killer clean platform for pedals. I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, it will break up as you push it. it. You know, it's really kind of designed on the platform of a lot of the um, the, the clean amps of the, the 60s and the early 70s, the, the, the you know, U.S. built. You know, I, I spent years playing deluxes and super reverbs, and it really, to me, is it really feels and re responds to me the way those always have. A very simple clean channel, the lead channel, bass, middle, and treble, and then it has an input, a, a level and a drive, your master and the drive. And if you notice, I have the drive set pretty low here, but we'll listen to it through all the different ranges. And then over here, we have a global presence and reverb. Um, on the back of this amp, in any PRS amp, there will be a, uh, an effects loop. There will be foot switchable, like the reverb and the channels are foot switchable. Um, the, uh, the bias, there's bias jacks and probe points on the back. So all you, you don't need any uh, special meter. You don't need to open up the amp. You can take an inexpensive um, multimeter and just plug it in and bias your own power tubes very easily. They're very easy to service amps. Um, if you read the specs on the website, Paul talks about how the fact that the, all the tube sockets are, are directly mounted to the chassis, which are a lot more stable. There's, everything is soldered. There's no push on um, connections. Um, the idea was to build something that is durable and stable and, and you can take it out to gigs and, and not have to worry about it. Um, it is all tube. The, uh, it has a tube driven spring reverb tank in it where it's becoming more and more difficult, especially in the sub $1,000 amps to find a true spring reverb tank in amps anymore. Every, everybody's going to DSP and digital reverbs, which are cool. You know, they, they can sound really good, but nothing sounds uh, to me like a spring reverb better than an actual spring reverb. Um, so let's start off and listen to that. Check out the reverb on, the, on this on both channels. So I'm gonna start off with the reverb up about halfway. Here's the amp uh, on the clean channel, completely dry. Okay, so super dry. Now if I kick on the reverb, I'm, I'm using the um, foot switch down here. So it's really nice long tail to it. Um, I'm going to crank it up to the max just so you can hear how it responds. Super lush. Uh, the one thing I love about all of Doug Sewell's reverb circuit designs is even with that cranked all the way up, it doesn't get overly boingy. Uh, like a typical like surf reverb. Um, but as you're playing, it will really stays kind of behind you. It almost kind of feels like your note is out here and the reverb is enveloping it around the back. It's very three dimensional sitting in the room with it. Um, and it's out of the way when I'm playing. And then when I stop, you really hear it. Um, but that's even at maximum settings. Um, you, so it really is usable all the way across the sweep. There's plenty of amps where I play where you have to, the, the reverb is a real sweet spot. You find that one spot where it sounds great, turn it down too low, you can't hear it, and then you notch it up a little bit farther and it, and it overpowers it. Uh, this one is really easy to set and it's very three-dimensional. Uh, if you notice, I've got on both channels, the EQ controls. Uh, I don't know if, how well you can see them on here, but. Uh, the bass and the treble controls are just set at noon. That's kind of where I start on any of uh, any of his amps. Um, this volume on the on the clean channel is set pretty low. There's a lot of headroom. It's only 20 watts, but it's um, it's very gigable. Uh, you know, if you have a drummer that's louder than this amp, then you might need a plexiglass shield or a new drummer. This is uh, definitely club worthy. Uh, if you're playing anything bigger than clubs, it's going to be mic'd anyway. Um, uh, but anywhere from halfway up on will start to break up a lot like a lot of the old blackface designs and stuff 
all have. Um, I, my favorite setting on the clean channel is I push the, the treble up a little bit and roll the bass back only because it really starts, especially with humbuckers, it really starts to break up a lot sooner uh, when the bass is cranked up. But it's a, it's a beautiful, round, warm, very easy to play. And before I go into the lead channel, I'll just show you what it sounds like by kicking on like a low to mid gain drive on the clean channel. So it takes pedals beautifully. Um, right now I've got, uh, I'm running a couple things through the effects loop. Nothing is on other than that drive pedal. All the reverb you're hearing is through the amp. Uh, kicking over to the lead channel, I'll show you starting off with the uh, drive setting pretty low. And again, all the, the EQ controls just set at noon. Now, I'm a, personally a fairly low to mid game player. Uh, I don't play a whole lot of like super high gain stuff. I love it. I just don't find myself in that world very often. Um, so I tend to, I find myself leaving this, you know, somewhere between nine o'clock and 11 o'clock most of the time. But just to show you, um, what I'll do is I'm going to kick on a, a little backing track here and just play through it real quick. Um, and I'm going to just kind of play it on the lead channel and every couple riffs i'll just keep turning up the gain and so you can hear the entire uh, spectrum of that so how about this one here this one will work doesn't really matter where it's set it's very musical very you know I, that cranked all the way up sounded cool but I love that lower mid gain area um, uh, when I'm using this on a gig um, it, it kind of also depends on the guitar I'm playing but um, I, I find myself uh, you know in that that zone that little sweet spot but Paul always says you know doesn't matter how much gain you put on an amp uh, when you design it, there will always be somebody who says it needs more gain, it needs more gain. Uh, there's lots of pedals that'll do that, but um, you know, it's, you know, it's got a huge range, but it's super usable. I find a lot of amps that are, have a, a high gain threshold don't sound great when they're turned low. They kind of usually have one sweet spot. Um, I encourage you, if you ever have a chance to plug one of these in, just turn the knobs around. It's really hard to make it sound bad. Um, uh, before we jump into any questions, if there are any, um, a couple other things I just kind of want to talk about as far as like the, uh, the tube complements and all that stuff. It is designed on, um, 6L6s, which seems kind of strange for a amp of its power rating. Normally you think of, especially like American sounding amps using 6V6s for anything in that. 25 watt and under 22 watt 18 watt is usually a 6v6 and then you get into 6l6s once you get over like 35 40 50 watts um and then obviously 100 watts you have a four power tube version of like 6l6 and in the british sounding amps it's usually el84s for the lower watt stuff and el34s once you get up into that higher power range so 
Uh, this was designed, and almost all of the lower wattage PRS amps, uh, the MT-15, which is Mark Tremonti's signature amp, uh, the Archon, the low watt Archon, uh, which is a, a 25 watt, um, very modern high gain amp, are all designed on a 6L6 platform. And I always have to relook it up. It's a 6L6 GCMS. It's based, if you were to look at it, it's actually a, a short body, a small body 6L6 tube. Um, so it looks different than a typical 6L6, and it does have a slightly lower voltage uh, rating. Um, but it's kind of choked down to 20 watts. And when I was talking to Doug Sewell, asking him why he chose that, as opposed to just using a 6V6, which is a you know great sounding tube, um, his answer was that if he was designing this amp in the 60s, in the 50s or 60s, he totally would have used a 6V6. Um, he said, in today's market, there are better sounding more affordable and more reliable 6L6s on the market than there are 6V6s. So building an amp in today's market, you especially a tube amp, you wanna consider what your tube uh, options are in the market, especially if you, you know, not, they're not gonna sell these amps going out and trying to find new old stock 6V6s to sell them. Um, so the choice was for a better sounding, more reliable and more affordable tube that you can purchase uh, in today's market. So that's uh, that's why he chose that. Hey, uh, man. Yeah. Let me interrupt you for a second because you, you got, it. got people salivating about the prospect of owning one <laughs> of those stamps. I want to show people how they can enter. Oh, you know? yeah. Good idea. So, uh, Seth, can you show the uh, road trip PRS True Fire you know, kind of main promotion page. There you go. And as you can see on the right hand side, there's all kinds of ways for you to earn entries, no purchase necessary, no monkey business, you know, that kind of thing. But um, just by visiting the site daily, you earn entries. And then on the left hand side there, it's a little difficult to see, but there's a kind of a daily trip agenda, right? Um, and if you participate in, in any of those fun things, you earn additional entries. So keep scrolling, Seth. I want to show the whole prize pool, if you would. So what will happen is throughout the month, just for visiting, just for playing around with some of these fun things, you can earn and accumulate entries. There you go. Hold that right there, Seth. And at the end of the month, we will randomly select winners of these prizes. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I think um, it makes sense to say that the more entries you have, the better your chances are of winning. Uh, right. We also have, Brian, I want to tell you, we have viewers from... Uh, a few places around the world, Italy, Connecticut, Fort Worth, Tampa, Toronto, Pasadena, Cleveland, Austin, Tennessee, uh, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, the Netherlands, Romania, Turkey, Rome, and Singapore. Isn't that crazy, man? That's great. PRS um, is, uh, has international distribution, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, my, I remember, it was 91, I think. And uh, I'd been saving, working in bands out of New York, saving my money to get my hands on, I think, one of the very first artist series. Had yep. to be 91 or 92. And I remember buying it, I believe, at Manny's. You know Manny's 43? Oh, yeah. That was like the hang. Yeah. And, um, so I bought that artist series, loved it, um, begged, borrowed, and steal to get my hands on it played with it for years and as you know misfortune you know seems to follow uh musicians around had to sell it to pay the rent and put some food on the table um and i've been looking you know i've been looking for that guitar ever since i mean since 91 i want to show you a picture um that uh I, is the, is the same model seth can you show that picture um it's up it's right. beautiful it's up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mine was 
charcoal or black. Okay. And yeah. This particular guitar actually is at Replay, which is in Tampa. And I'm going to pop been in there and have a look at it there. And, you know, they're an incredible shop. They love you guys. Um, but I, the clinic there a while back. Yeah. Those, those guys are uh, off. Yeah. They are, you know, just super people with a super store. So I'm going to go check that out. But, you know, what is it about Paul Reed Smith? Like, you know, the vibe, you know, when he first came out was this boutique, super high quality, excellent, you know, and that vibe exists today, you know, like he for and the company and the team and everyone that's involved has somehow managed to maintain this, you know, level of quality, superlative level of quality. And I say, and, and look, this isn't gratuitous. I mean, I'm a PRS freak. We have tons of them in the studio. Um, and you can, um, e even the less expensive models like are killer. Yeah. What is the magic ingredient over there? Well, so I, I grew up in Annapolis, which is the home, home base of Paul and where the company started. That's that my introduction to Paul was he was the local guitar builder. Um, like the guitar you're talking about, the factory had been open for about uh, seven years, you know, the, I mean, but he had been building guitars locally before that. So there were lots of players in the area playing pre-factory PRSs before anybody else outside of our town had heard of them. Uh, but I was at that time, I mean, I was too young. I, I wasn't like out doing gigs until like 1990. You know, I graduated high school in 90. So um, I knew of him. But um, I, I would say the, the seek, well, it's not a secret ingredient. What it was is think back to the mid eighties and think about even iconic brands, you know, where their quality was. Like it, that wasn't really the golden era of electric guitar manufacturing. Nobody looks back at that and says, that's the pinnacle. There were fine guitars made then, but that's not really you know, almost every company had been bought and sold multiple times. They were making killer guitars in Japan. You know, the, you know, the guitars coming out of Japan are still sought after from the eighties. Um, and Paul came around and started hand building these guitars. And his whole thing was old school design. He wanted to know what made the vintage guitars of the golden era magic because he doesn't believe that it's the age it's not that the age is not what you and he what he says if you were to say old guitars sound better because they're you know they've had time to age talk about all the iconic guitar tones that we idolize they were recorded decades ago a lot of them like you know wind cries mary was not a vintage strat the guitar was a brand new guitar right off the rack when you know but um he said it's the way they build them, the way the woods they choose that, you know, Paul is ob as obsessive about that as, as anybody I've ever met. I think that what makes, he built his company on setting this incredibly high bar of quality. Um, and he is just passionate about figuring out what makes things tick. He's constantly pulling things apart. And if you look back at just the pickup designs of his guitars over the years, it's hard to keep track of because he's always trying to make it better. He's always trying to, if it's going to make it half a percent better, he's going to do it. And he's taking things apart constantly and trying to push things forward instead of looking backwards. Um, and at the same time, looking to the designs of the past for what was great about them, what needs improvement. The thing is they've grown, uh, but they fit in this kind of weird spot. They're still kind of like a big boutique company. I mean, if you go there and you meet the people who work there, they're people who've been there. I actually worked at the factory for a year out of high school in 1992, around the time your guitar was built. And um, I was there for just about a year. And then I joined this band and kind of left off. I realized I, I'm much better at playing guitar than I am at building guitars. And um, but I, a lot of those people that were there then, I met, and they're still there now. Uh, and, and they would have been a, a, somebody working in the you know, 1200 grit sanding stage in the finish hall uh, is now the art director. Uh, uh, you know, or you know, somebody who worked in final assembly is now a, 
a division manager. You know, almost everybody has come up through the bottom. They hire through um, through the company, and everybody there has the same passion that Paul does. They all believe wholeheartedly in the product, and if you go there, you you can sense it. It's a um, there's a lot of pride in what they do, and Paul holds everything to a very high high standard. Um, and he's not, as long as he puts his name on it, he's never going to compromise that, um, which makes it difficult. It's hard to build things. It's easy to build an expensive guitar if you want it to be great. It's hard to build an affordable guitar and, and keep those, you know, that's been the trick. You know, the SE line was a big, uh, a lot of work. And, and uh, we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about the acoustic on, on that date. Uh, the S2 line, which is one of the, dead, uh, one of the giveaways that we're going to be doing um, I'll talk a lot about on that day what makes the S2s differ from the cores and the SEs and where the price differences are. If you're comparing, you know, several guitars of the same model from the import to the S2, which is still U.S. built, to the other one, uh, I'll talk a lot about where that price difference is. And, um, you know, it's it's fascinating stuff if you're into the history of, you know, guitar. Um, one thing I tell people a lot is that... Um, you know, Paul, Paul will say he has to strive to be better because he'll never be able to go back in time and say, Jimi Hendrix played my guitar at Woodstock or Jimmy Page played my guitar on the, you know, on Zeppelin IV. Like none of that, like you can't go back in time and have those things. And if you were a brand that was around from the beginning you have that built in that will, can never be taken away from you. He's like, I'm the new guy, relatively speaking, you know, and really he is. If you think about the, the like kind of the lexicon and the timeline of rock and roll history, by the time he opened his factory in Annapolis, David Lee Roth was no longer the singer of Van Halen. Like that's how late in the rock and roll game yeah. he came out. So he's like, I don't have, he goes, all I have is my reputation. All I have is, is, you know, my, here is my instrument. Here is my amp. It has to speak for itself. You yeah. know, you know, he, um, I don't know, in my head, I, I, I think of Paul as sort of the, what Steve Jobs was to Apple, right? Mm -hmm. I think of Paul in that same with PRS. And in both cases, um, you know, their standards of quality, very, very high. But in both cases, it was all about the team. You know, a yeah. team that shares that same passion, you know. Absolutely. His ability to kind of, in, in, you know, ignite that passion and maintain it for so many years, you know. Um, it's not easy being a guitar manufacturer, especially today, right? For sure, yeah. Um, it's just an amazing thing. And it's one of the reasons we're really so thrilled for both of our companies to kind of get together and do something like this together. Um you know, because we're, you know, look, we're proud PRS owners and players. Um, we share a lot of artists. They come in. They're super passionate. We always do our best to try to, you know, sneak into the studio and give their PRS a go. You know, in, in fact, we have um, scheduled for the middle of the month. Um, uh, uh, we're doing a we're having three PRS artists. Uh, Tony McManus. Oh, yeah. Corey Congilio and David Grissom. You know? oh. um, and they're going to spend a couple of hours uh, performing and teaching. And, you know, every time those guys come in, it's just, uh, you know, a, a lot of fun. And they are likewise inspired by this kind of PRS magical, you know, passion. Oh, yeah. So anyway. Well, David, David um, and Paul, of course, go way back. Oh, yeah. uh, David had a, a lot to do with the design of the McCarty series. Um, and uh, he and Paul collaborated, uh, collaborated a lot on that and, and it was also kind of the launch of uh, David's own model, the DGT, which is, has always been one of my favorite PRSs. Um, and plus, I just love his playing. And Corey, I actually met Corey a couple of years ago, uh, right about the time he got his first PRS. Mm -hmm. And we happened to be on a gig together. Um, my band was... Uh, doing a show with uh for a radio station that he was uh, playing um uh playing guitar for a nashville artist and um 
And we just start talking and he sees my guitar and he's like, oh, I just got one of those from, you know, Rich Hannon at PRS. And, and then we start, I was like, well, I do their demos. And he started, and we realized that we both kind of, you know, and since then we, you know, we've, we talked pretty regularly, but you know, he was, it was funny. Cause I, I see these people who necessarily weren't always PRS people, you know, like, yeah. and uh, he was playing as SG all the time. And he's like, I hadn't really played a PRS in a long time. And man, I tried this thing and man, I, you know, blew me away. And, oh, yeah. um, I, uh, you know, I, I see that all the time, like at NAM, like people coming in and trying things out. And um, it's really fun to to kind of watch people rediscover them. And they have changed over the years, but also the PRSs of the 80s were designed for the what was, you know, they were 24 fret necks and trem guitars and hotter pickups. And it, that's what people wanted then. And those models are still there. But uh, he, they're building so many more like vintage inspired instruments that really speak to me more i like i mean everything they build is nice but um and this amp is kind of a good example of that like the archon amp is a really cool sounding super high gain amp with a killer sounding clean channel it's fun to play but it's not the kind of stuff i do this to me can cover you know pretty much everything i do i mean it's i it's a great clean pedal platform it's a great uh the lead channel is super versatile um as a matter of fact if you want to roll those two um yes. i'm sorry i i oh, don't know it's it's all good <laughs> but <laughs> i have got time so go uh tommy you want to roll um set up the video yeah so so what i did was because I, I know that uh sometimes through these zoom calls um the the audio uh can get a little funky uh you know by the time it's broadcast um so I thought if I recorded something here and sent it to you and you played the video directly so it's actually not going through Zoom, hopefully it, it, it will give you a slightly better um, or less uh, affected by, by uh, bandwidth. <laughs> um, so there's a, I, I took one backing track. It's a minute long little clip. It's actually a clip uh, that PRS asked me to build some backing tracks for them to, to send out at a, for a play at home thing. Uh, so it's a simple little two chord, three chord chord progression. On the first one, I use um, a Silver Sky with single coils and play uh, a rhythm track clean. And then halfway through, I come in and play uh, a little solo over it, still on the clean channel. And then um, the other one, I go over the same minute long clip, but I actually use this uh, 594 S2 that will be given away. And... I do the same thing, play a rhythm track and then a lead track, but with humbuckers on the lead channel. So if you want to start off with the clean one, we'll just hear the yeah. same amp, two different guitars, um, and both in the rhythm and lead setting. Here we go. <laughs> So that's the um, that's the Silver Sky, uh, you know, going through a couple different pickup combinations. Uh, I mean, all I really did between the lead uh, track and the rhythm track was for the lead track. I just cranked it up just a touch more, just to cut through. Um, I really didn't do anything in post. It's it was just kind of a pass, warts and all, um, just to give you an idea of um, what it sounded like. Um, to me, it, it sounds a lot like a like like my '60s Deluxe. Uh, just has that very familiar uh uh really usable uh sparkly top end but uh just the right amount of mid-range uh you know the the low end on that i probably bring it down a little bit i love the the way the amp sounds in the room uh, it's got 
plenty of low end. Um, so I tend to run it back just a little bit with humbuckers so it doesn't push it too much. Um, the mid range to me is where that's where the guitar player lives. It, it's all about the mid range. If the, if the mid range is right on an amp, um, I can make it work. Um, and this one does not have a mid control on the, on the clean channel and I don't miss it. The 50 watt does. It's a larger chassis. Um, that was part of the reason why I originally went with a 50 watt. Um, but on this one, it's, it just sounds right. I never feel like I need to adjust it. Um, the lead channel has a mid control in case you want to scoop it out or anything. Do you want to play the same yeah. track now, but just uh, hear what yeah. it sounds like with the humbuckers on lead? Let's do it. Right. It's um, I'm, I'm glad you pre-recorded some of these things. It really does help with the overall you know, sound quality for sure. Um, you ready to answer some questions? Absolutely. OK. And guys, um, here's your opportunity. This gentleman eats, lives, breathes, plays uh, PRS and anything you want to know. I've got a feeling he can give you a good answer for it. So here's a couple to start with. Post them in, uh, post them in the live chat, and we'll get Brian to answer all of them if we can. Um, the first question in is, um, what is the lightest electric PRS? One of the hollow bodies, perhaps. Um, this is yeah, Fremantle. Right. So there's a couple different. There's the SE hollow bodies, which are brand new, uh, super lightweight. Um, hollow bodies have a different sound so if that's not your uh what you're looking for uh two of the lightest ones the mira which was recently discontinued in the s2 line but brought back in the se line um is a very lightweight guitar um the uh and the vela is another one that's also very lightweight i would say like the mira if you find a mira semi hollow um or even just the new se mira um, part of it is the, the stop tail is a much lighter weight piece of hardware than putting a trim in the guitar. Um, there's, I don't think I've ever picked up a PRS that I f thought was like heavy, you know, um, I think the heaviest one I've ever played was a 513 and there's a, a pretty massive amount of wire, copper wire in, in, in the electronics in that one. Um, but it still was not, it was very manageable. Uh, anything hollow or semi-hollow, but the, if you haven't played a mirror, check one of those out They're They're super lightweight. Cool. Here's a question from Mark. Uh, he wants to know, is 20 watts enough for a jazz guitarist in an 18 piece jazz swing band? So, I mean, definitely it's loud enough. But you're talking about volume for clean headroom too. So uh, if you're trying to, if you're being put into the PA, absolutely. Um, you know, I would imagine, um, depending on what situations you're in, if you're trying to do stage volume and get over all the, the brass instruments, uh, depending on your guitar, if you're using a lower output pickup, and you're playing conservatively, you know, I find that amps like this, 
like by the time I get it halfway up, it's starting to break up a little bit. But especially if I'm using uh, humbuckers, and, I'm, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll play on the clean channel, and I'll crank it up a little bit. You notice once I get up around here, especially on the neck pickup, um, it's starting to break up a touch. And, but if I'm, you know, if I back off my volume a little bit and play a little softer, you know, it's really a lot of how you approach it. But headroom might be what you need um, if you're looking for uh, clean, clean, uh, which you probably are in, in, in what you're doing. Uh, the 50 watt version of this amp is physically just a little bit larger and um, it has obviously quite a bit more headroom. It's still the same single 12 platform. Uh, both of these amps use a Celestion V-Type speaker, which is a great sounding speaker. I actually, when I got mine, um, I'm a tinkerer, so I try things all the time. So I swapped out speakers and tried a bunch of different Celestians. I had some um, cream backs and different things and speakers I love and other things. And I ended up putting the V-Type back in it because it just sounded great. Um, it's what they designed the amp around. Uh, you may like the 50 watt. Uh, the other cool thing about the 50 watt version of this amp is that not only does it add a mid-range control, but because it's a wider chassis and they have more room to do it, there's actually two volumes on the clean channel too. Um, it has a, an input volume and an output volume. And if you turn the, the master volume all the way up and then use the other one as input, you'll get the biggest, cleanest, roundest sound that amp can produce. If you turn the, the input volume all the way up and then use the master volume on that channel, um, it's chimey or brighty, uh, brighter, it's almost uh, jangly, uh, and it breaks up pretty early. So it almost gives you a, a whole different voice. Um, but I would say, I would say you probably would want the 50 watt version. And I think it's a hundred bucks more. It's not, um, if you're looking at these new there, it's not a huge difference in the price. Uh, but it's hard, hard to say for sure, but it, this amp may break up before, uh, you know, depending on how loud the band is. But if you're being to a PA, you're probably fine. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Brian, we've got underneath the video um, links to both guitars and to the amp. And I'm sure if you click on any of those links, if you click on the amp link, for example, you'd be able to check out the 50 watt as well. Yeah. And there's demos, there's specs, but there's also demos on all that stuff on, yeah. uh, on the page. Yeah, there's a really, really good representation, you know, of, uh, you know, sonic quality, all this, everything you need to know. Please follow those links. They're underneath the video. Um, while you're hanging out underneath the video, you see that little thumbs up thing there. Please click that. It's a great way to show our appreciation to Brian uh, for taking the time to give us, you know, this presentation and for setting up those cool lights all around here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a very cool vibey thing, um, but um, it's a, it's a great way to show your love and to spread your love uh, for Brian and for PRS for you know uh, partnering with us and putting this great thing together. There's also um, we we keep getting asked how to generate entries. Guys, can you show the PRS True Fire Road Trip main page, please? It's up. Um, Again, there's no purchase necessary. You don't have to do anything more than just go to that page, click a button, and you're earning entries. You could you could do that in two seconds and pick up. I think it's I, I think it's ten entries. You can do that every day. Um, but if you participate in some of the fun things in the daily agenda, they change every single day. Uh, number one, I. I, I think it's a good use of your time. I think you'll learn some things. I think you'll be exposed to some things. And uh, another cool way to generate um, more entries. Um, here's another question for you. Uh, CM wants to know, can you still get good tone at low bedroom volumes with the amp? Good question. So uh, I will say the clean channel is... Uh, it sounds beautiful uh, all across the sweep. 
the lead channel on this particular amp reacts a lot more like a vintage amp to me, where some of the other, uh, the Archon, uh, the MT-15, there's a master volume to where whatever you dial in your preamp sound, the amount of gain you want, it doesn't matter where you are in the master volume. It sounds very neutral. So a bedroom level to cranked up, um, the sonic character of the amp stays about the same. This particular amp on the lead channel, it changes a lot across the, the sweep of this, of this level, just like a vintage amp would. Um, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing for everybody. For me, I, I look at it when I'm in the studio, that just gives me a whole bunch of different palettes. So I kind of find the spot where the, I'm pushing the power tubes exactly the way I want and you know adjust the, the drive on the front end uh, to, to my tastes. Um, but I will say that the amp sounds very good at bedroom levels, but it's just different across the sweep. Um, the sweet spot for me is, might be too loud or louder than you want to play it. Um, uh, I, I don't crank up amps in here as much as I put them in there. So most of my playing on these is at gigs. Um, so obviously that's not as much of an issue, but, um, I would say it sounds very good at every volume, but it's going to sound different in different volumes. There are the sweet spot really changes, um, on, on the sans air specifically, but I will say as a pedal platform, like I tend to my world most of what i do is clean channel with pedals and then i use the lead channel um when i'm doing a grab and go but um i love a clean pedal because there's so many amazing overdrive pedals on the market so if i were using this as a bedroom amp um i i probably would set it up that way clean pl pedal platform we have in chat brian landreth who says first that he loves sansera amps and then uh, also comments, uh, it looks like he's got a 50, says the 50 is great. Yeah. And he said, yes, you can get a good tone at a low bedroom volumes with the Sun's Era 20. So a bit of a testimonial from someone who actually owns the amp. Um, you've been great. Have you forgot right. to tell us anything important about anything to do with PRS or the prize pool? Is well, I look forward to dig. So we're going to dig into the, uh, I think next week is when you have the, uh, have your guests, when you have Corey and, and uh, Tony and, and David coming in. Uh, and I look forward to watching that too. And then uh, two weeks from now, we will do the, uh, we'll go in depth on the S2594 single cut. We'll be talking all about the specs. Um, and playing it, listening to it. But the, you know, really a lot of it is gonna be explaining how this differs from the Core 594, where the main price differences are and, and why. Um, the S2 line to me, bang for the buck, is just absolutely incredible. So uh, I look forward to doing that. And then the, uh, the final uh, week we'll be talking about the, the acoustic line in general, but we'll be focusing on the T60, like I have hanging up back there, which is, uh, my my personal choice out of all their models, that's the one I picked for myself, um, and that's the one that they happen to be giving away. So um, I'm looking forward to both of those. Yeah. Uh, let's see, you're back with us on May 22nd. Yep. May 29th. Uh, Tommy, tell us yeah. when the uh, when David and Corey and Tony are doing that special thing. Yeah, that's on uh, the 14th of this month. Like Brian said, I think it's uh, next uh, Thursday. If, okay. if my you calendar. You do not is. want to miss that one. That's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. That's and awesome. um, where um, I, I believe Ali has posted a link to where you can see the full schedule for the month, which which you can also get to from that main uh, yep. PRS True Fire Road Trip page. There's a link there at, you know, 24 seven to see all of the events, everything that's happening. Um, again, underneath this video and on that page, you'll find links to all of the PRS uh, instruments and amps that are featured this month and that we're gonna be talking about and demonstrating. Um, Brian, you're awesome, man. It was, 
really, really, uh, you know, just super of you to spend the time to put such a thorough presentation together. I was so looking forward to this myself being such a PRS freak myself. Okay. So I've enjoyed it. I'm sure as much, if not uh, more than anybody and really looking forward to the next show with you. Cool. Absolutely. And uh, one thing I'll mention too, is that uh, if you're a PRS fan, uh, you may have known that they do their big, uh, every couple of years they've been, I think this would have been the 10th one where they do the PRS experience, their big open house, yes. uh, which of course, unfortunately had to be canceled. Um, and this was going to be, a, this is an anniversary year. It's 35th anniversary since he opened in um, 1985. So um, what they've decided to do is tomorrow they're going to be doing on the PRS YouTube channel, they'll be doing a uh, virtual experience. I think it's around 1.30 um, and, uh, it'll be, there'll be a bunch of like clinics. I'm actually doing a, a little talk with, um, Tim Pierce on there about sitting in your home studio and recording and oh, really? Uh, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so if any, anybody, uh, couldn't make it to any of the past Pierce experiences and would like to have, you know, see kind of what it's about, uh, tomorrow on the PRS YouTube channel, there'll be, uh, there'll be all kinds of stuff happening. Awesome. And what time does the party start? It starts at 1.30, and I think then they're going to do a little bit of a break, and then they're going to uh, – then the second part starts at 2.30. It's not terribly long. And then um, and then it's going to wind up at 4 o'clock will be the uh, – Paul will come on and do kind of some closing remarks, and then he's going to uh, premiere and debut a, a, a new web show that PRS is doing called Long Distance where Paul um, – does this he you know does a, a a zoom call with you know all kinds like alex lifeson from rush and steve Vai and all these Very cool. people and uh so yeah so if you want to check out some more prs stuff and probably actually i wouldn't be surprised if uh, i think actually david uh several of your uh, true fire instructors will be on there doing clinics and presentations too so well, I guess uh, we'll be seeing you there as well. By yeah. the way, Corey Congelio just chimed in and said hey to you. Corey, yeah. Uh, I, I'll give you a call. Just told him about um, your date with uh, David and Tony, so we're looking forward to that. Um, uh, Brian, we have one more vid. Why don't you set that up, and we'll that'll be our outro. We'll play that. And yeah. The, the Jason yeah, if I, one is uh, what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the video, if you want to play the video that's um, uh, with uh, Jack McLaughlin, is that the one? Yeah, that's what I meant. Yep. You want to watch that one? Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. Yeah. One. Yeah. Sure. So um, this uh, this next clip is a demo. They brought a couple players in Bosco France, who's killer. Um, and uh, Greg Irwin from the band um, Magnolia Boulevard, that's awesome. Uh, g both of them are great players, great slide players. And uh, they brought in another guy who, who won a contest uh, to win a PRS, who's a, a New York, a young guy in New York who's a session player. Um, and he, he won, he's been playing a PRS CE uh, since he was a kid. He got it as, as and, um, and he happens to actually be a, a kid who was a student of mine. I met him when he was about 11 years old, and I worked with him at the School of Rock for years, and a great, great guy named um, Jack McLaughlin, and he's a great guitar player, uh, plays a lot of pedal steel, um, and lo and behold, PRS brought him in and had him do a, um, a, a demo on the Sanzara 20. So uh, you can hear uh, him playing some beautiful, clean neck pickup uh, jazz stuff on it. Awesome. Brian, thank you so much, man. We will see you tomorrow, actually. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll be back with you here in two weeks, and we'll, uh, we'll dig back in. Looking forward to it. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Brian. See ya.